and welcome to the webinar in the draft Federal Provincial Territorial Justice Framework to address violence against Aboriginal women and girls. My name is Emily Arthur and I have with me here Sherry Lee and we'll be your presenters today. We're both senior policy analysts with the BC Ministry of Justice and we're participating along with other senior justice staff from across Canada in creating a framework for ministers of justice and public safety to work in a more coordinated manner on the issue of violence against Aboriginal women and girls. So today we'll start by giving you some brief context of which I'm sure many of you are familiar on the scope of the issue of violence against Aboriginal women and girls in Canada, as well as some information on some BC provincial initiatives aimed at addressing this issue. And then we'll provide some background on the draft justice framework, which you all should have received along with a copy of the PowerPoint presentation that we'll be working from today. Then we'll go ahead and walk you through some of the key components of the draft framework, which we're seeking feedback, feedback and input on, in order to give you a sense of what the content is in the framework. And then we'll conclude with some details about our process for gathering feedback, and then next steps in terms of finalizing the framework. Um, we're, we just ask that if you have any questions, that you leave them to the end of the presentation, so we make sure that we can get through the content and hopefully address some of your questions ahead of time. And certainly we're open to questions and feedback at that point. And as Steve said, if you have any technical questions, you can use the chat feature or you can email Steve. Um, and as well as Steve said earlier, if we can make sure that you're muting your phones rather than putting us on hold and then um, we should have a smooth sailing moving forward. So violence against Aboriginal women and girls is obviously not a new concern. But as more information becomes available, the number of women and girls who are victims of violence, it becomes really clear that this is an urgent issue that requires immediate action. From this slide, you can see um, Aboriginal women's risk of becoming a victim of violence based on findings from self-reported victimization data. So violent victimization is defined to include sexual assault, robbery, and physical assault. And Aboriginal women are found to be three times more likely to be a victim of violence than non-Aboriginal women. And this was true for violence that they experienced at the hands of strangers, acquaintances, friends, family members, or spouse. Um, obviously, no amount of violence is acceptable, but these statistics are staggering. The statistics you he see here on this slide are from Stats Canada. And depending on the source, the statistics vary a bit, but they're all equally uh, point to the issue of how poignant this issue is and the need to address it. Moving to the next slide, you can see on this map that there are significant Aboriginal populations in every region of our country. So in terms of absolute numbers, Ontario has the largest Aboriginal population followed by here in BC. But if you look at it in terms of percentage of population, Manitoba, for example, has 17% of the population is Aboriginal people. In Saskatchewan, that's 16%. So once you're combining population stats like these with victimization rates we discussed earlier, it's clear that violence against Aboriginal women and girls is an issue across all areas of Canada, and as such requires responses at all different levels. So from local responses at the community level to provincial and territorial level responses to nationwide. Um, in BC, there are a number of provincial initiatives, both ongoing and more recent, aimed at addressing violence against Aboriginal women and girls in our province. An example is the Minister's Advisory Committee Council on Aboriginal Women, so MACAW, which was established in June 2011. And their job is to provide advice to government on how to improve the quality of life for Abor Aboriginal women across British Columbia. Um, in Sorry, I'm just hearing someone on the line. If you can mute your phone, please, star six. Okay. Um, in June two, in 2014, so this past June, coming up on a year, there was an MOU signed between the Premier Christy Clark and Aboriginal leadership outlining a joint commitment to address violence against Aboriginal women in our province. The MOU commits um, all parties to working towards shared priorities, um, working on uh, core relationship and implementation principles, actions, targets, and of course, indicators of success. And there's a joint Aboriginal government partners table that's being developed to ensure that this shared commitment uh, continues moving forward. Um, in February, we just recently released the Violence Free BC strategy. Uh, a strategic priority number four in this strategy is to address violence against Aboriginal women with specific goals and actions tied to that strategic priority. 
in terms of other provincial action plans, there's the Provincial Domestic Violence Action Plan that was released in February 2014, which has a specific focus on direct services for Aboriginal women, children, and youth, um, with specific focus on joint development of programs and services to support them through uh, addressing the issue of domestic violence. There was also the Human Trafficking Act three-year action plan. We're in the second year of that. And one of the three priority focus areas is Aboriginal communities and looking at preventing and addressing, addressing domestic trafficking of Aboriginal youth and women, including immediate and longer-term actions. And then most recently, at the end of February, was the National Roundtable on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. And BC participated, along with uh, uh, families of missing and murdered Indigenous women, national Aboriginal organizations, and other provinces and territories, as well as staff from the federal government. Good morning, everyone. I believe we are now going to go to our first poll question. So prior to this webinar, did you know about the draft FPT justice framework to address violence against Aboriginal women and girls? And we're getting some responses. Looks like, oh, we got another response. So it looks like that might be it for the responses. And it looks like 40% of you have heard about the, the draft justice framework, so that's great. 60% um, have not heard about the draft justice framework, which makes this next slide uh, very appropriate. And there it is. Uh, so what is the draft justice framework? And I guess the best way to, to think about it is it's really intended to be a roadmap for the justice system. Uh, the purpose of the draft is to provide a focal point for discussions across the country about how the justice system can improve how it responds to violence against Aboriginal women and girls. It is primarily meant to be an internal tool, so it's designed to help FPT, so that's Federal, Provincial, and Territorial Ministers of Justice and Public Safety across Canada, focus on the justice-related priorities that Aboriginal groups have said are the most urgent priorities in addressing this issue. And it will evolve as it continues to include more feedback from Aboriginal groups and other stakeholders such as yourselves. It, uh, it needs to be flexible, and it will continue to be flexible so that it can be used to address a wide range of justice policies, programs, and services across the country. And it also needs to have flexibility built in in order to allow justice departments to work um, with their stakeholders to develop approaches that meet local needs. So I'll give a very quick overview of the background to how this work got started. This issue, as, uh, as has been mentioned already, it's not a new concern for justice and public safety ministers, but the profile of the issue has grown uh, as more and more people become aware of it. And as some of you may know, um, premiers, Aboriginal leaders, international human rights organizations, and others have all been raising awareness about this issue. So in October 2012, uh, the federal, provincial, and territorial ministers responsible for justice and public safety talked about what they're doing to address this issue across the justice system. And if you take a look at the draft framework, which I believe was sent out to you yesterday, 
on page six you'll see uh, a table that outlines how the justice system can respond from prevention to intervention and support, enforcement, court, and follow-up. And through that spectrum, there are a number of things that justice ministers and justice personnel are doing to address the issue. But ministers agreed that there really was a need to develop a, flex a flexible framework that would guide a more coordinated approach to the issue. So senior uh, justice and public safety staff across Canada worked together to look at the, all, all of the available research that was out there. There were a number of recent reports that had come out with recommendations about this issue and tried to find, you know, what are the common themes, what are the common recommendations that we keep hearing. And they used this information to develop the draft justice framework. Now, as we were developing that draft, we knew that we couldn't really develop the framework that ministers wanted because ministers had asked us to, to develop a, a justice framework and present it to them the next year. But we knew we couldn't do that without talking to Aboriginal peoples. We wanted to get input from Aboriginal organizations, from communities, and from other stakeholders across the country. But we weren't able to do that at the time because the, uh, the work that we were doing, the, the federal, provincial, territorial justice work, is based on a foundation of confidentiality, and that is to protect intergovernmental working relationships. So the only way we could do that was to go back to ministers at their next meeting and tell them that we can't provide them with a, with a, with a final document, but we can give them a draft so they can see the, the direction we're heading in. And we asked them if they would release that to the public so that we could have these discussions with Aboriginal people and other stakeholders. And they did that in November 2013. So why do we need a, a develop, uh, to develop a justice framework? Well, justice and public safety ministers have heard what Aboriginal groups, communities, families, and other stakeholders have said about how to stop the violence. They've read the reports, they've heard uh, the recommendations from consultations, and every province, territory, and the federal government have been taking action to prevent and respond to the violence. But ministers agreed, as I, I noted earlier, they really need to work together so that every government is taking a common, consistent approach to the issue. And they want to take what they've heard from the research and consultations and from feedback received on this draft justice framework to refocus their efforts. This, the framework is, is, as I mentioned, going to be used uh, primarily internally by the justice system, by governments, but it can also be used as we work with Aboriginal partners, non-government organizations, and communities. And I believe we're going to go into our second polled question here. Is more research on this issue needed, or should action be taken without doing more research? So we have some differing viewpoints there. Uh, this is a question that it, you know, it would be really good to have a, a lengthier discussion about at some point in the future. But um, thank you, everyone, for responding to that. That's very helpful feedback. Okay, so uh, there are very clear strengths and uh, there are also some limitations to the framework, so we just wanted to discuss some of those. So in terms of the strengths, um, is that it promotes a common approach by ministers to encourage greater coordination and collaboration and try to get away from a more peaceful, piecemeal and ad hoc approaches. Its flexibility also allows for each province and territory to use it to guide the development of actions that will meet their unique needs. 
because there is a lot of interest in the issue around the country and other groups talking, taking action to address the violence, so it creates a lot of flexibility about how that's approached. As well, in order to take account of the work underway, it's a living document, so um, it will be able to be updated as things change and priorities move and uh, action is taken on the issue. So, for example, the recent National Roundtable on Missing and Murdered Women uh, indigenous women um, resulted in a public release of a framework for action, which is actually now quite consistent with the draft justice framework. And moving forward, we'll make sure that the draft justice framework is connected to other work on this issue and look at how we might be able to better support each other and in terms of provincially and with the feds in terms of moving forward to stop violence against Aboriginal women and girls. In terms of limitations, um, because it needs to be flexible enough for provinces and ter territories to tailor it to the provincial and regional priorities and to help align it with work already underway, it doesn't offer specific commitments around funding or actions. Uh, it's instead a higher level visionary document that outlines principles and priority areas of focus for action. So unlike an action plan that has specific actions and timelines and that sort of thing, it's more of a framework document for the work underway. Um, and although it's been made clear that action needs to be taken in many areas, like health, housing, education, and those sorts of things, in order to really make meaningful progress on ending violence against women, we need to look at all of those issues. This framework is narrow in scope in that it focuses just on justice-related priorities. So now that you have a bit more background of the purpose and development process for the framework, we're going to walk through key components of the draft framework itself. Um, and I just want to welcome participants to walk through, look through the draft justice framework that was circulated to you. You can look through it as we speak to some of the content. So one of the main components to the draft justice framework are some suggested principles. And these were identified based on the review of research and consultation reports that was done. And it's really, uh, it's, it's um, an attempt at trying to capture what are the guiding principles that ministers should be using and justice partners should be using when we are uh, addressing this issue. So the, the first principle, and they're not really in any particular order, uh, the first principle says that preventing and addressing violence against Aboriginal women and girls is everyone's responsibility. And this, you know, the, the word everyone, we really mean globally. We mean individuals. We mean um, other sectors like health and social services and education, the private sector, communities, uh, both Aboriginal communities and non-Aboriginal communities. We really mean everyone. Um, and the justice system alone has recognized for some time that the justice system cannot stop the violence on its own. Um, in order to address the root causes of the violence and other issues such as racism, it, we really need to have everyone involved. The second principle talks about the need for healing. And this is something that we came across in a number of reports um, that Aboriginal peoples talk about the need for healing of individuals and communities. The third principle is that Aboriginal people must be partners in developing and implementing responses. And this is not in any way to take away from the fact that we do know, in a lot of cases, Aboriginal groups and communities are leading efforts. So we know they are leading efforts. But when the justice system, this, this principle is speaking primarily, I guess, to what the justice system is, is intended to do. When we're developing new policies, new programs or services, Aboriginal people should be included as partners in that process. The next principle is talking about the need to involve men and, and boys in addressing this issue. So addressing violence against Aboriginal women and girls requires behavior and social change. Men and boys must be involved. We know that men, whether Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal, are most often the perpetrators of violence. So the principle is intended to ask that all men and boys be involved in speaking out against that violence. But, you know, while we're talking about violence against Aboriginal women and girls here, we also know that men and boys are victims of violence and are also negatively impacted by the violence against their sisters, their mothers and daughters. With regard to the next principle, flexibility is required to respond to the diversity of Aboriginal people and communities. This suggests that the framework can't dictate a one-size-fits-all approach. 
Responses must be developed at a local level, so that might mean at a provincial level uh, or at a community level in order to meet local needs. And th these types of approaches also have to take into consideration the, the social, the cultural, and the economic diversity across the country. Uh, the rural and urban split, you know, there will be very different, uh, very uh, uh, huge differences in what's needed in, say, downtown Toronto to address this issue as opposed to a northern community. And so that's um, the reason for the flexibility principle. Okay, so now we'll talk a bit about the, the proposed justice priorities within the draft framework. So based on a review of research and consultation reports, as well as discussions by justice and public safety ministers and their staff, the framework itself suggests potential priorities for justice system actions if we're to approach uh, the issue of violence against Aboriginal women and girls effectively. So it's important to note that as a justice framework, the focus again is on priorities that justice and public safety ministers have responsibility for and a mandate to address. So other priorities, like I was saying, like education, employment, or income assistance aren't listed here because justice and public safety ministers have no authority to take action in those areas. But like. Uh, Sherry was saying, in terms of the principles moving forward, we would like to engage all of those partners so that you're uh, approaching this issue in a more comprehensive and fulsome way. Um, so in terms of the priorities being put forward, um, bullet one, you'll see it's changing attitudes and behaviors that perpetuate violence against Aboriginal women and girls through public awareness initiatives. Another priority is to support community-led safety initiatives. Um, and then priority three um, refers to community, and when we're talking about community, we're talking about everyone. So Aboriginal communities, non-Aboriginal communities, and society in general, from individuals to governments to nonprofit organizations to the private sector. And the third suggested priority refers to this fact and it proposes that justice and public safety ministers encourage other government de departments and communities and others take action. So like I was saying earlier, they're justice pri system priorities, but working together with other partners to do this in a more comprehensive and collaborative way. Um, a strained relationship between the justice system staff, including police and Aboriginal people, is another key priority theme that has arisen, and it's often cited as a, a barrier to prevention and response, so this is one of the priorities that has come up. Another is improving responses to domestic violence in particular, as one form of violence against Aboriginal women and girls requiring priority focus and attention. And then bullet three is looking at every stage of the justice system from prevention to enforcement to court and exploring how to build on successes and promising practices and also how to address challenges related to the issue of violence against Aboriginal women and girls. So from prevention, it could be programs for youth to enforcement, which could be facilitating reporting of violence um, to court providing support such as Aboriginal court workers. Um, with reg for the next uh, slide, um, the top priority uh, speaks to alternatives to mainstream court. And this priority recognizes the need to provide Aboriginal people and Aboriginal communities with alternatives to the Western justice system. And in some cases, it's in the best interest for the victim and offender or family community to use an alternative to court. And in other cases, it may not be. Um, so using alternative to court isn't always possible or necessarily the best thing to do. So you'll see in this that it's worded very intentionally as where appropriate and effective. Number two, um, it's very clear from what we've heard in consultations and discussions with key stakeholders that healing is vital. So a uh, priority might be community-wide process that restores balance and wellness within the victim, offender, and their families within the community. And the last suggested priority refers to the fact that governments across the country are all taking action to address this issue, but those actions are rarely coordinated with other governments. So it's hoped that this framework will help to improve that lack of coordination by getting ministers to agree to focus on the same priorities and also encouraging them to look for opportunities to work together on this. Um, we're going to do a third poll question. So Steve, if you could pull that up for us. So the question is, who should be involved in preventing violence against Aboriginal women and girls? Should it be government? Should it be communities? Should it be the justice system? Or do we all have a role in doing this work? Uh, 
Okay. So we have about 14 responses, and it's unanimous. So we've just heard the suggested principles and potential justice priorities that are included in the draft justice framework. The framework also discusses the need for healing, provides examples of how the justice system is responding to the issue, and discusses the need to involve other sectors. Ministers developed the draft to reflect what they've heard so far from the research and consultations. And at this point, they're asking for feedback because they want to know. Are these the principles we should be applying? Are these the right priorities? Did we, did we hear right when we were listening in those consultations, when we read those reports? Did we get it right? Is there anything missing with regard to what justice ministers have a mandate to do? And are we taking the right approach if we follow this framework? And I would I highly encourage you to review the framework and provide feedback to us. Um, if you would like to provide feedback, there are some questions here on this slide that you might want to consider. So again, are these the right principles? Are these the right priorities? Who else should be involved and how can they get involved? So in terms of the next steps, so we are looking forward to receiving input, um, input from from you and, and others around the country will be used to revise the draft justice framework. The draft will then be presented to the FPT justice and public safety ministers at their next annual meeting for their consideration. And as we've mentioned before, every province, territory, and federal government are addressing this issue, but they're, they're all at different stages of responding to this issue. I mean, each has different priorities, different relationships with their Aboriginal groups and communities, and different needs and resources to address those needs. Some have undertaken a lot of consultation with Aboriginal peoples in recent years about issues related to violence, while others are just starting to have those discussions. Some have done a lot of work to address family violence issues, while others have focused efforts on responding to missing and murdered Aboriginal women. So given all of these differences, the framework must continue to be flexible to meet the needs of all of the provinces, territories, territories and federal government. And this means it must allow each jurisdiction to decide how it will address the priorities in the framework. It's hoped that, uh, that governments, if, if ministers do sign off on this, they do, if they do approve this fr framework once it's been revised, because as just a reminder, this is the draft version you're looking at, it will be revised. And once it's been revised to reflect the input of Aboriginal people and others, uh, we're hoping that, that the uh, justice departments across the country will use it to focus on these justice priorities in the framework because once it's, it's completed, it will reflect the priorities that have been identified by Aboriginal groups. And in BC, as uh, Emily mentioned, we expect that the implementation of the framework for us is really tied to the related initiatives we have underway. And, and Emily spoke about some of those earlier, uh, Violence Free BC, uh, the Provincial Domestic Violence Plan, the BC Policing and Community Safety Plan, and other related initiatives. So it's really uh, aligned with existing work that we have underway, which is, is good, and will help to continue to, to guide our efforts on those different initiatives. And we have one more poll question. And the question is, what type of action is needed to prevent the violence and to respond in situations where violence has already occurred? Do we need public education and awareness, social and economic supports, law enforcement and courts, health care, including mental health and addictions treatment? Or is, is it true that a broad range of actions are needed? It seems like we have another unanimous response. That's great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.
And that brings us to the end of our presentation. So we, as I said, we very much welcome your comments on the draft, um, either in writing to the email address that you will see on the screen any moment now. Um, there it is. So you can send me an email and provide your feedback that way. Or if you prefer, we can arrange a time for you to provide your comments by telephone. I know that not everyone has the, the time or interest in typing out um, comments, so you're welcome to contact me by telephone. I should also let you know there will be a teleconference on April 23rd to allow another opportunity to provide feedback on the framework. And if you're interested in joining that teleconference, uh, please contact me at, um, at the above telephone number or email and I will send you the, the teleconference information. Are there any questions right now about the presentation? So there's a question about funding. I'm wondering about funding to go along with the initiative. Is there any funding? Um, no, as we indicated on um, previously, there, there is no specific funding tied to the framework. However, one of the purposes of the framework is to help guide action when funding is available. So for example, we know that you know, we do hear of announcements of funding for various initiatives related to this issue. Um, it could be federal funding, provincial funding, and what we're hoping is that when the funding becomes available that people will use the framework to guide whatever it is they're developing um, to address this issue. And so I think our hope is that the framework will help inspire uh, governments to provide funding to address this issue and provide funding that addresses the, the key priorities that we've identified here in this framework. So no, there's no specific funding attached, but um, different provinces have already talked about how they're going to implement the framework um, using existing funds or ex uh, tying them to existing initiatives. So it looks like we might be waiting on another question. Okay, um, next question. Are there efforts to get feedback from families of murdered missing women and women survivors of domestic violence and abuse? Um, yes, the, the efforts to engage in discussions about the draft framework have been um, very diverse across the country. So we've had a, a very different, um, a wide range of approaches in seeking input into the draft framework. A number of jurisdictions have consulted directly with uh, missing and murdered women, the families of missing and murdered women or advocacy groups. Um, they've consulted directly with survivors of violence. And so it's, uh, it's difficult to say exactly where because um, we're still collecting that information. But a number of jurisdictions have done that. In British Columbia, we haven't specifically gone to, um, to the families of missing and murdered Aboriginal women because we recently, um, as you know, have um, uh, been working on responding to the, the recommendations from the Opal Commission, uh, the, the inquiry that took place here in British Columbia. And so we've already had a number of conversations with the families about related issues. Um, we've also consulted with um, uh, a broad range of stakeholders um, 
on the BC Policing and Community Safety Plan, for example. So there, there have been a number of um, related discussions going on. And, and what we're doing in terms of getting input on the framework from those groups is we're using what they said, what they told us in those other consultation forums and bringing that to help uh, make revisions to the, to the framework. So rather than go back to the people and ask them the same questions basically that we've asked them previously, uh, we felt it would be more respectful to use what they've already provided us with. Um, that said, if, you know, if there are family members that want to provide direct comments, we would be very happy to receive them. Um, next question is, how do we get this to the top of the list for funding priorities? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I think just having this framework, you know, if it becomes approved by all of the ministers across Canada, I think that alone just keeps it at the uh, top of their radar. Um, it's an issue that, as I said, they've known about for many, many years and they've been addressing. But it, it hasn't been until just a couple of years ago that they decided that they need to develop a framework and they need to get on the same page in addressing this issue. So I think just the fact that we're developing it, um, the fact that a lot of people have been interested in providing input is another, um, I think, good way to, um, to keep this at the top of the list because ministers can see that, um, yes, we put this out there and we got a lot of feedback on it. That means there is interest and people care about what it is we're doing and they want to see us do more. So if we can keep that momentum going, I think we can put this at the top of the list for funding priorities. Um, there, there has been, um, you know, a significant amount of funding injected to address this issue, but of course not nearly enough. Um, and I think that all governments recognize that we need to do things better. And one of the things we need to do in addition to providing adequate funding is we need to work with our partners better. So um, I'm hoping that the framework can uh, maybe help with those two issues, inspiring more funding and inspiring governments to work better with partners. I think we're waiting on another question. So the question um, or comment is, the concern is that if we spend more on research than on action, that Indigenous women will continue to face hugely elevated levels of violence in our communities. Yes. and that. That was one of the, the reasons we put the question in there. And, and as I said, the, the poll question is really something that could be discussed at length. And unfortunately, we don't have the time here. But I think that is a concern is that, um, you know, in, in some cases, some people see it as a stalling mechanism as well. It's a way to avoid taking action. Um, I don't think that's the intent of anybody who's working on this issue sincerely. I think we want to see action happen. And I think there is a legitimate need for research in some areas. I mean, we do have um, a lack of research on certain statistics to do with Aboriginal victimization. Um, we have, I mean, there are a number of areas that we could do more research on, but I wouldn't want to see that uh, delay action. And I think that that's the, the message that um, justice staff have been conveying to ministers uh, is that we, we need to continue to take action, regardless of if we continue to do research or not, action should be the priority. Um, we have enough recommendations and we have enough input already uh, from reports and from, directly from Aboriginal peoples to know what actions we could start moving on. Um, and so that, that is the goal, is to keep ministers and, and justice stakeholders focused on action and um, you know, at the same time, considering what other research might be needed, but um, definitely the research, I think, would be a secondary priority. So are there any other questions that folks have today? I should say that um, I'm also available um, not just to receive input, but to receive questions. So if anyone has questions after this webinar, please feel free to phone or email me. Um, and
And it's uh, so most of you have the, the slide up, but my contact information, Sherry Lee, uh, Ministry of Justice. My phone number is 250-953-4261. And my email address is Sherry, S-H-E-R-R-I dot Lee, that's L-E-E, -E, at gov.bc.ca. So I think that might be it for the questions. Uh, I would really like to thank everyone for participating. I think it's been uh, it's been really good for us to, to have this opportunity to talk to all of you about the framework. Um, we again highly encourage you to provide feedback, and we want to make it as convenient as possible for you. So if you have feedback on the draft framework, please call me and uh, let me know what would be uh, the most convenient way for you to provide that feedback. I'd like to thank uh, my co-presenter, Emily, and uh, big thanks to Steve as well for all his technical help. We couldn't do it without Steve. Um, thank you to everyone, and uh, I hope you'll be in touch. <laughs>